Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on educating employees to prevent phishing attacks. My name is Shannon Lane and I'll be your moderator today. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few of the housekeeping items and to let you know how you can participate in today's session. All attendees are currently muted, but you do have an opportunity to ask questions using the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. We have a great agenda for today. We'll be sharing essential tips for building and maintaining a successful security awareness program by answering four key questions we often hear from IT and security managers. One, what are the security threats targeting my employees right now? Two, how do I put together an actionable security awareness strategy? Three, how do I engage staff and make them a part of the solution? And four, and possibly most importantly, how do I measure success? Okay, let's get started by introducing today's speakers. Kevin Poniowski is a senior security instructor and engineer at Security Innovation. He brings a blend of speaking ability, tech savvy, and an insatiable passion for security to Security Innovation's training customers. Kevin entered the application security field in 2007 with Security Innovation, where he has split his time between application security course development and delivering instructor-led courses. Damien Grace is the founder and general manager of Friendly Fishing. Damien has led the ethical hacking team at Shearwater Solutions for over eight years, where he has seen the impact of fishing on organizations firsthand, specifically when his grandfather was scammed out of his life savings. He has made it his mission to create an effective anti-fishing training solution to educate users and Friendly Fishing is now currently providing training for thousands of users across Australia and New Zealand. With that, I would like to hand over to Kevin. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is Kevin Poniatowski. And uh, today we're going to be talking about, well, specifically I'm going to be talking about uh, some basics of security awareness, uh, how to you know, prevent these types of uh, attacks from occurring uh, just by doing some simple things that we can do. And the great thing about a lot of these uh, things we can do to help our security awareness is they are beneficial both in the office and at home. So just quickly a little bit about uh, security innovation. Uh, we are based in the United States in Boston and we are an application security company. So uh, we spend our time uh, instructing software development teams about how to create more secure applications. So it's developers, testers, project managers, as well as the rest of the uh, employees of an organization to help them become much more secure in their uh, ongoing at working activities. So we see data breaches in our newspapers and on television much more frequently today than we used to. And it's, we're seeing them more and more often. And while some of the attacks that we hear about can be fairly sophisticated, I will tell you this, that the attackers, the bad guys, they're always going to try the easy attacks first. Because unfortunately, these are the ones that work the most common. And so there are some steps that we need to take to make sure these easy attacks don't work. Uh, the bad guys are not going to use their super duper technical attacks first because they've worked so hard on them. They're going to try the easy things first because it's so common. So often they'll take advantage of uninformed staff members who are not aware that they're acting in inappropriate and insecure ways. And so it's our goal to talk about a few of the things we can do to help lower the risk of these attacks becoming successful. So one of the reasons why we're having such a huge problem with security is that when it comes to our development team members, Security is just one of the many, many jobs that they have to do throughout their day. But most of the time, they're focusing, focusing on functionality, how to create these applications uh, that do such wonderful things for us. 
So security is just a small part of their everyday activities. On the other hand, the bad guys, the attackers, breaking security is their number one job. And they're very, very good at it. So they get to focus all of their mental effort into finding ways to bypass the security within our organizations. While our development team members just spend a short period of maybe not even every day, maybe just a short period every week focusing on security. So right now, the bad guys, the attackers, they are better at breaking security than we are at making sure that they can't get in. So we're going to talk about how do we lower the risk of this happening. So our goal is to make sure that the attacker's job is so difficult it becomes very frustrating and very time consuming. Even to the attacker, time is money. Our goal is to make it so difficult that it's just not worth the expense for the attacker. The attackers, they need to make money too. They, uh, they have to pay rent for their apartment. They have to buy food. You know, often they have families also. So we want to make it so difficult for them that it's just not worth their time to spend on us unless they are specifically targeting us for a specific piece of data or something like that. In that case, then, um, you know, they, they're, they're going to work very hard uh, and try to find ways past our security. But often attackers, they are just looking for easy opportunities. So if we make it very difficult for them, then hopefully they will go away and find someone else who's, who just hasn't spent the time in security than we have. So we can lower the possibility of a successful attack. We can lower the risk of someone within our organization perhaps in, uh, performing an action that ends up being uh, helpful to the attacker. But one of the things we have to realize is we are all targets. It's very easy for us to pretend, well, this will never happen to me. No one will ever target me. No one will ever target my organization. And that's, not, that's just not the case these days. Uh, I was at a software conference uh, about one year ago, and it was not a security conference. It was just software. And at lunchtime, I was sitting with a table of software developers. And surprisingly, we're talking about security. And one of the developers told me, he said, well, in my company, we don't worry about security because only our customers use our website. And I thought to myself, that's really, really naive and innocent and unfortunately uh, not very um, aware of what's happening in the real world because it's almost like saying, I don't lock the front door of my house at night because only my friends come over. So it's not true. We have to be aware that we are all targets right now. That's the way the internet works. So we have to be aware we are a target and we have to understand security best practices and follow them to lower the possibility of a successful attack. So let's start with our, our first step that we can take to help prevent us from becoming a victim. And the first one is we have to update our mobile devices and install patches whenever they come out. And I know it's so easy to say, oh, I don't want to reboot my machine. I don't want to take the time to install this patch. Believe me, it is worth it, uh, especially for Apple devices. It's so easy for iPhones to download that new patch and install it as quickly as you can. And the reason why we need to do that as soon as that patch comes out is because there's a race going on, because the bad guys, the attackers, they also get the patch. And very often, that patch is security related. So when the bad guys get that patch, they're going to attempt to reverse engineer that patch that Apple sent out to find what was the security vulnerability that Apple was fixing. Once they find that out, then they're going to try to find a way to attack that security vulnerability. While 
we waste time and don't install the patch on our machine. So it's a race. Do you patch your machine first, or do the attackers find a way to attack that security vulnerability that patch was trying to fix? Now, it is much easier to do this on Apple devices than it is on Android devices. On Android devices, the responsibility of sending the patches to the users of the mobile devices, uh, um, we're relying on the, um, uh, the companies that handle your mobile device. So it may be months before, once Google sends out a patch, it may be months before your cellular provider pushes that patch down to an Android phone. So it's much easier with, with Apple devices. However, within your organization, it is difficult to patch all of the machines in your organization because every once in a while a patch comes out, see like a Windows patch, and it actually breaks the machine when it's in, intending to fix the machine. So organizations have to test to make sure the patch won't break the Windows machines. So you know, if you have tens of thousands of machines in your organization, it's going to take a lot longer to patch them. So it's easy, much easier to update a personal device. So we just recommend update it as soon as possible. You're lowering the risk of something bad happening to you. So we need to stay up to date with these patches because you never know when something horrible could happen when you're running an insecure version of an operating system on your mobile devices or an insecure application on your mobile devices too. So every time you notice that an application needs to be upgraded, we really recommend you do that as soon as possible. Because every year thousands and thousands of mobile devices and computers are successfully attacked just because they have not been updated to the latest version. And this is something, you know, personally I said before, is easy for us to do usually. At the organization level, it's rarely uh, software developers' responsibility. It's probably part of the networking team that has to do that. But there is a race going on. Who install? You know, are we going to install the patch first, or are the attacker is going to find a way to attack that vulnerability? So we have to be very careful and very vigilant about doing this. So we saw a couple years ago when the Heartbleed vulnerability was found that this was a big issue. So Heartbleed was a vulnerability found within the computer code of the OpenSSL component. Now this was a very important uh, component that lots of applications were using and it was used to protect very sensitive data within applications. However, it had a very easy to find vulnerability within it. And this component was used on millions of machines. So now when that vulnerability was found, the developers fixed it, and then they pushed out the news to everyone across the world saying, you need to update your open SSL component immediately because we have this horrible security vulnerability. And lots of people, they did that. They updated those components. However, a lot of people didn't. Even 17 months later, after that news had gone across the world, there were still thousands of machines vulnerable to the Heartbleed attack, and it was easy to find them and easy to steal their data. So thousands of machines were still vulnerable. They didn't patch the component that they were using. So this is something simple that we can do, and too often we're not doing it in a timely fashion. Next one, and this is a really important one uh, within your organization and also at home, is being very careful about email. So we have an example here where uh, attackers were targeting executive email accounts. So they would compromise some, in some fashion an executive's email, but they wouldn't do anything for a while. They would wait for that executive to go on vacation. And then when that executive was out of the office, they would send an email that appeared to be from that executive to the executive's assistant. And it would ask them to transfer a large amount of money 
to an overseas bank account or to an overseas business. And within that email, there would be a lot of stress to uh, say, to tell the assistant, you have to do this immediately. This is very, very important to try to scare the assistant into just doing it as quickly as possible and not think about what was really happening here. They wanted the assistant not to think, did this email really come from the, from the executive? Even though it does appear to be coming from the executive's email account. But it wasn't from the executive. It was from the attackers. So we really need to make sure whenever we receive an email at home or at work, that we need to make sure we authenticate that the creator of that message is really the person asking for something. For example, sending them sensitive data or banking information or something really important to us. We need to make sure that that person is the one who really wrote the email. And we had this happen in my company early this year. Uh, one of our executive assistants received an email that appeared to be from our chief financial officer. And it told her to immediately send him all of the employee income forms because a department of our government here in the United States was, was auditing our company and they needed those forms immediately. Well, thankfully, my company is fairly small. We're just over 100 people. So our uh, executive assistant knew our chief financial officer personally and knew that he would never use those words in an email to her. If it was this important, he would have called her. So thankfully, nothing bad happened. But a lot of bad things did happen to people when they, uh, assistants did react to these emails without thinking about authenticating the writer, the creator of that message before responding. And sometimes, even the email address where these emails came from wasn't within the organization. It was close to the organization's email address, but it wasn't the same one, maybe one letter off. So we have to be very, very careful about that. So according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, over 215 million American dollars were lost to these types of email scams. And all it would have taken was a quick check to make sure, did the writer of the email, did the writer that the email appeared to come from really want this, these tasks to take place? You know, access to business email accounts is much more valuable than most people realize, so we have to be very careful about this. So if you ever wonder, why would anyone ever want to compromise your email? Uh, here's a list of many different reasons why your email address is a target of attackers. So when it comes to having a strong password for your, your email account, we really recommend doing that because there's lots of different reasons for attackers to want to hack not only your email account, but your coworkers and your boss and your executives. All of those email accounts are targets for attack. And so we can't tell ourselves, oh, we're not a target. No one even knows we're here. That's not true. We are a target. So to, uh, I want to uh, finish up with my portion of this webinar and just talk about when it comes to browsing the web securely, we really, it's very easy to fall under the assumption that the Internet is as safe as Disney World. It's so convenient for us. There's so many wonderful things we can do on it. However, the Internet is not Disney World. The Internet is like the wild, wild American West where nobody is following the laws and everyone, there are attackers everywhere. We need to be a little more paranoid about whenever we're using the Internet. Now, I still do my banking from my laptop. I still go shopping on Amazon.com. However, we have to remember the Internet is not a safe place. We have to be a little bit paranoid. A little bit of paranoia is a good thing when we're using the Internet. 
So just remember that. Uh, you know, we just don't want to go shopping at sites where we've never heard of them before. Uh, take the time to do a little bit of research and make sure we're not falling for something sneaky and someone's going to steal our money or our, our, our data. And so now I just want to introduce to you uh, phishing attacks. And uh, um, phishing attacks are one of the most common attacks we see today, and they're just becoming more and more common. And they utilize social engineering, which is just lying to you to try to trick you into giving away sensitive information and so you don't think about it and so you just react to the email or the trick that the attackers are using, they're going to threaten you with some kind of punishment. Like you're going to be fired from your job or your child needs money and they won't get it and something bad will happen to them. So they'll threaten you with some kind of punishment in a phishing attack. But for more information on phishing, I'm going to throw this to Damien and he's going to explain all about phishing to you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and good morning, everyone. And uh, Kevin just raised some actually some really good uh, points there, specifically around the easy path versus the complex, and the and, and also around uh, user paranoia. And I'm going to be covering uh, a few of those in the in the coming minutes. Uh, so just as a way of background, so. Uh, my background is in ethical hacking uh, and penetration testing, and uh, part of our role is we used to do a lot of the standard uh, phishing assessments, the old school, the, the old way of doing phishing assessments. So we send out phishing emails and we try to um, trick users, and you know our whole goal was to trick users or try to exploit them and and get onto uh, the machine, and by and large. It's pretty trivial to do this, and we started to uh, look at uh, our customers, and some of them would come to us and say, "You know what? We have an annual awareness training program. We put posters up. You know, we do things. So we're expecting to see a much better result than from from us than you'd see across any one of our other, you know, anyone else that you test." And what we found is that the results were really no different. Uh, people that do awareness training versus people that weren't would, uh, by and large, have the same issues. And so we started to dig into this and started to really probe it and find out exactly what the problem was and why it is that the standard phishing education approach wasn't working. And what I'm going to do uh, is share some of those findings with you and, and let you see how the, the traditional approach is relatively flawed and uh, there's a much better, much more effective way and I'm going to leave with you some actionable things that you can do to, to implement this within your organization. So I guess firstly, why is phishing so effective? And this goes back to Kevin's point before around about um, paranoia and also the easy versus the complex. So if you think about it, and Kevin touched on this as well, 10, 20 years ago, people were actually scared of the internet. They wouldn't use their uh, credit card online and you know, they would uh, essentially use pseudonyms or um, you know, we wouldn't, well, if you look at things like uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, a lot of those uh, services and then things like Amazon and the like have really broken down that fear that we once had. Uh, especially the younger generation, they're so used to consuming data online where just every day everyone's consuming data online. It becomes second nature for us to interact with the online world. Then if you look at <clears throat> the history and the evolution of hacking, you can see that uh, what used to be easy was network level hacking. Things like the heart bleed and the like, they weren't so much done on a mass scale, but people were able to uh, almost at will connect to machines, be able to get in and be on side, inside people's networks. 
And then patching and the like started to catch up and uh, this became a harder avenue. It became more complex. So the attackers started to move to the, to the next easy um, target. And that next easy target was kind of around about the, you know, the early 2000s. And the Web 2.0 craze came about and a lot of really cool information was going onto the internet and uh, web pages were becoming more functional and more interactive. And so we saw the attackers start to move into those areas and a whole heap of new terminology, SQL injections and cross-site scripting and all of these things started to come about. Things that didn't exist before uh, were now you know, high risk and high priority. And then again, as things happened, the, the security world started to catch up. We started to realize that we needed to patch this inf patch websites, we needed to penetration test, and a lot of that's become par for the course. So those avenues for attack are also now starting to really um, reduce. I mean, you can't get the keys to the kingdom like you once could. And so that really leaves the, the people. People are now primed. It's the perfect storm. People are now primed for consuming online information. We've lost our fear. We're no longer anonymous. We have the ability for bad guys to find out almost anything about us, who we are, who our family is, what we had for lunch. You know, it's a completely different environment. And so the attackers have no choice but to go after us, and we've made it easy for them. And that's really opened up the door for phishing uh, attacks. And it's, it's a very different world now than what it was even 10 years ago from a cybersecurity standpoint. So really, the problem is that day in, day out, there's more and more phishing emails. Uh, some of the stats out there are talking upwards of 30% growth in phishing emails year on year. Uh, that's a staggering amount. When you look at how many phishing emails go out now and thinking about that going up 30% year on year, it's a huge uh, amount of phishing emails. And I'm sure every one of you on the call at the moment has been seeing that, and, and that's why you're here. Uh, ransomware in particular is, is a big driver for a lot of people. It's kind of like the, the squeaky wheel. You know, these kind of attacks have been happening for a number of years, but they haven't been noticeable. They've been quite covert. And things like ransomware and, and also the, the executive, you know, wire fraud and things like that have really started to raise the profile of phishing and makes the, the board level pay a lot more attention to it. <clears throat> so the problem is that technology can't stop it. Technology can reduce it without a doubt, but it's not a silver bullet. And most organizations spend a lot of money on technical controls, and you absolutely need technical controls. But the problem is that they're not investing the same amount of time and effort in effective, um, in, you know, people training. So what that ends up happening is that you end up with a bunch of people that uh, are disillusioned, they don't know why they're doing the training, they don't really care, and the end result is that people think that training doesn't work. They come out with that mentality of, oh, we've got to do more training again, you know, and it's, it's really kind of the opposite effect to what you would want out of an effective uh, phishing awareness program. So just before I jump into giving you a bit of a, uh, a bit of a guide on how to create a, a phishing and effective phishing awareness program, I just want to cover off a couple of pitfalls because uh, these pitfalls are big and it's something that we see people making the same mistake time and time again and a lot of it comes down to doing things the historical way. So the first one is <clears throat> treating users disrespectfully. A lot of, I mean, phishing is a technical subject and technical subjects are written by technical people and a lot of technical people are, you know, people that don't necessarily have good people skills. 
And there's a big trend in IT security uh, and IT as a whole where technical people will treat non-technical people like they're dumb, like they're idiots. And it doesn't make people feel good. Uh, it, it kind of goes against what you would want to achieve when you're uh, creating an effective uh, phishing program. And uh, it's one of the things that can actually completely deter users from wanting to take part. Uh, a lot of users are actually scared of technical training. So it's very important to uh, treat people the right way throughout this, especially with phishing training where, you know, what you have to do, there's no two ways about it, you have to trick people. So the other thing is tricking rather than training. So yeah, you have to trick people, um, but there's multiple ways of doing this. The traditional method that I said before, sending out the hardest phishing email you've got, your entire goal is to get people to click, is an old way of doing it that's, that's relatively ineffective. The way uh, that it's better to be done is to give them phishing emails that are actually designed to help them grow, to help them learn, not to be the hardest things they've ever seen and to make them fail, but to give them the ability to see something that they've just learnt and make them win. You also want to make sure that you're doing your program more than once a year. <clears throat> that traditional method of sending out a phishing email once a year and trying to exploit the user, you know, that's that's pretty much a that's it's dead. It's been, you know, fairly ineffective. It doesn't work. It's time to move on from that. Uh, even twice a year really isn't effective. You need to really, and it doesn't need to be the training, by the way, that needs to be done more than once a year. You need to be doing training and you need to be doing ongoing um, phishing that's designed to help people learn and to grow uh, and to um, give them those those abilities to succeed and, and to start off easy and gradually ramp up. And you also want to make sure that your material is not boring. This is this has got to be one of the biggest issues that I see in corporate education. You know, I look at a lot of corporate education and the only word that comes to mind is grey. You know, it's boring, it's dull, and people hate it. They don't want to do it, you know. So if you're going to give people education like that, they will not do it and it will not give you the benefits that you need. On top of that, you also need to get some specific buy-in within your organisation, high-level buy-in, as high as you can go. When you're sending out phishing emails, sorry, training emails, you want the person as high as possible up the tree to be able to send that out and say, hey, we need to be doing this sort of um, phishing, uh, sorry, training. If you don't take it at that level, if you, um, and I, we see this all the time, the security team comes in, they go, we see this as a huge issue. Um, we need this training and they implement the training and they can't get exec level or management level buy-in. You know, they're happy for them to do it, but they're not going to really support it. And that breeds a culture within the organization that, of that they don't need to do it and therefore they don't really uh, get into it. Uh, and it just, you, the, the attendance rate is also very low. So it's it's important to really get a high level buy-in and get them to promote this as much as possible. Also, HR and the learning and development teams are very important to get in early. They are specifically, um, they can be blockers uh, if you're in security and you want to get this across. They can be blockers if you don't get them involved early and you don't understand what they need and what they want. So for example, HR. <clears throat> HR are very concerned with making sure that you're treating your users right, and they should be. You need to be able to show them that you're not out to trick them, you're out to help them and show them step by step how you're doing that. Are you anonymizing their results? Are you uh, redirecting when they click on a phishing email to something that relates so they don't realize that it's actually uh, a phishing email? And then the learning and development team <clears throat> You know, for, for people in security, they're not usually the ones that are coming and saying, hey, we need these people to do this training. So it's usually the learning and development team. And so it's very important to get them 
involved early so they can see it, so they can be part of the solution and get their buy-in. And that if you get them in early and they can see how it's going to work, it dramatically uh, gets, it, you can get that uh, training through a lot quicker and a lot easier. <clears throat> it's also important not to focus just on high-risk groups. So we hear it all the time that we, we want to do this training and we want to focus it only on the executives or only on IT. And while that's, that's good, that's definitely worthwhile, and executives do get targeted specifically with whaling style attacks, it's not uh, the only place you should be targeting. In most organizations, or many organizations, they have a very flat network. And it's very easy to find out, especially with LinkedIn, people uh, on your network, uh, who they are, and make targeted attacks. And if I can get on to someone in HR, which is a very common way of doing it, or uh, even an administrator or anyone, you get onto their machine on a flat network, from there it's fairly trivial to pivot around and jump from machine to machine and get the information you're after anyway. So don't just think that because they've got more access, they're power users or more information access, that they're the only people you should be focusing on. And also, make sure you have solid metrics. Um, you need to be doing things to prove that what you've put in place is actually effective. Uh, you guys are you know, putting your name on it. You guys are saying, hey, we need this training. And so you need to be able to prove to management and other people that it's actually working. So what does success look like? Well, first of all, you need to start off with technology. I mentioned before, this gets the low-hanging fruit out of the way. So you need your firewalls, you need your email, you need your, uh, your any spam, your antivirus, all of those things. Yes, we can bypass them quite easily, but it gets rid of those low-hanging fruit and it gets rid of a large percentage of uh, phishing attempts straight up. So it's very important to start with technology. <clears throat> Second, you need to understand why you're doing this. You know, is it just to make, is it just to tick a box? Or is it because you care and you want your users to uh, actually build skills and um, be very effective at stopping phishing emails? You know, if, if you go into this with the goal of, I just want to have a baseline, then, you know, the, that old style, that old way of doing things is more suited. So understand what you're trying to achieve before you go into it. Create engagement and excitement. So this comes down to a lot of things. You really want people to feel like they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Get them wanting to do this. Have them seeing you know, the training on someone else's screen and saying, hey, I want to be part of that. And after they've done the training, saying, how can I share this with my kids and with my family? It's really uh, important to do things, to get them excited, to make them want to take part. And ultimately, <clears throat> as I said before, treat them with respect. Everything should be done uh, to guide them through a process. You know, understand your users. So most users in most organizations are non-technical. And so by non-technical, you know, they can use Word and, uh, you know, Excel and, you know, whatever programs they need for their day-to-day -day life for work. But if you ask them to break down a, um, a URL, you know, their eyes will glaze over. So you need to understand that this is the audience in most organizations and you need to target your training and your uh, phishing emails at that audience and give them the ability to win. And then over the course of time, slowly send them harder phishing emails and give them more training and harder phishing emails and build them up. You also want to create that culture of uh, reporting phishing emails and you know, it's okay to fail. Um, <clears throat> if, if someone's clicking on a phishing email and they think they're going to get in trouble, they won't report it. And what's that going to do, you know, to the organisation? We've seen people where they've obviously clicked on a, a ransomware email and they're going, it wasn't me. And it's like, but we can see it was obvious to you and they're like, it wasn't me. You know, so we need to make sure that they feel comfortable reporting phishing emails both before and after 
um, they've taking, taken an action, if any. Again, measure, 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 measure. If you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going. So make sure you're measuring every step of the way and then it helps you guys look good as well. <clears throat> and repeat and reiterate. Uh, like I'm saying there about complex, increasing complexity, this is not a one-time thing. You can't do it once a year and have people know how to, how to do this. So you need to build it up over the course of time. And it may take a non-technical user multiple years to get up to an extremely proficient level. But over that course of time, you know, they're starting to be able to see 80% of the attacks and then 90% and it just gradually increases the, the risk profile of your organization or improves the risk profile of your organization. So how to get people engaged? First of all, you need to understand WIFM. And WIFM is what's in it for me. And this is ultimately what everyone's about. So if they can't see what's in it for them, they will not engage and they will not be interested. So what we found is an extremely effective way is to put family first. It's not about your organisation, it's about them and their family, their kids, their parents, whoever it is. <clears throat> if you can tie it back to them and make them um, engage and understand that we're trying to help them uh, at that level, then it dramatically changes their buy-in. And again, it's also about understanding who they are and what level they are at. So most users, I mentioned before, <clears throat> are actually incredibly scared of doing technical training. They think it's going to be well over their head, they think it's going to make them look stupid. So understand your audience and then allow them to have fun with it and allow them to fail without any retribution, you know, allow them to really engage and feel comfortable uh, doing what they're doing. And then ultimately it's about continuous education. Training is only the start. Uh, training is really, to start off with, is all about getting a base of knowledge. After you've got that base of knowledge, you need to continue to give them opportunities to win. So you keep on sending them phishing emails um, that increase in complexity over time. And the other thing, and it's a really nice side effect, um, if you start off sending really easy phishing emails, you're still going to get people to click on them, um, which is fine. But what it does is it highlights the people in your organisation that actually are the most at risk to phishing emails. So by <clears throat> targeting these people specifically, uh, sorry, by uh, identifying these people specifically, you can have a chat to them. Maybe English isn't their first language. Maybe they weren't around when the training was done, whatever, whatever it is. It allows you to help these people individually or as a group, maybe as a classroom session. Therefore, you get to spend your uh, training budget exactly where you need it. And it allows you to build up um, the, the risk uh, profile of your organization um, over time. So really, um, the goal should be making your people succeed, uh, not making them fail. If you can make your people succeed, then ultimately it means that your organisation will also succeed. Okay, uh, thank you, Damien and Kevin. That was uh, very insightful. Um, uh, now we'll like to open it up um, to some questions. We've got a couple of questions uh, that have, we've received so far. Uh, I guess the first one I'll, I'll address to both Kevin and Damien. Uh, what improvement levels have you seen in organisations and are these improvements sustainable over time? Mm -hmm. um, so Kevin, I'll, I'll go first if you don't mind. So what we see uh, typically using our program, uh, the Friendly Fishing program, so we baseline people straight up and uh, that gives you an understanding of a risk to a highly sophisticated attack. And then we're able to do that year on year as well as to provide trend data as we go. Uh, the results that we see typically um, start off anywhere between the highest we've seen is 54% uh, click-through rate, so over one in two. Uh, lowest we've seen is 8% and we see an average of, you know, probably 22 to 25% uh, click-through rates. Uh, over the course of time, and if you can do it uh, regularly, we see that reduce significantly uh, down to a 5% level is, is quite often. It's, um, 
that's probably our average is what we see month on month afterwards. Okay. Kevin, have you got any observations um, from your end that you'd like to share? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, reiterate what Damien said earlier about that the once a year training really doesn't show any improvement with these numbers. Uh, they're going to stay the same, unfortunately, with the success, successful fishing rates. But once you do that continuous training, that's when you really see the improvement in your security metrics. Okay, fantastic. So again, continual uh, education and, and uh, ongoing reinforcement, that's great. Um, Next question is, um, what do you do if some of your users don't actually improve? I, I might start off with you, Kevin, on this one. Yeah, this is a tough question because you don't want to uh, make the user feel like they're they're uh, not doing a good job because it's important that 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 they they learn this lesson, and, you know. And really, they, I found that the way the best way to do this is. Just like Damien said, have a focus on family. A lot of these uh, security awareness situations are, are uh, the education is, is just as good for home users as they are for users or, or uh, employees at work. It's the same lessons that need to be learned. So if we can really apply it, the lessons so that will help their family, that's where they really, you really get that buy-in. And, and what's the buy-in? Everyone can learn this. Okay, great. Damien, um, observations? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of covered on uh, this part just at the end there anyway, but uh, we, we see this quite a bit within organisations where because of the way that we do our fishing, we, we're identifying uh, those people that are, aren't necessarily improving, repeat offenders and the like. And we see different organisations take different approaches to this. Uh, some take a, a hardline management approach where the managers are brought in and then the, they're, uh, you know, kind of reprimanded. And, and I personally don't think that's the best way. Um, really, the way I think it's best approached is finding out, one, why it's not working. You know, I mentioned before, sometimes, you know, in, we've, we've actually got a, a client where a large portion of their users, while in Australia, aren't English speakers you know, natively. So they don't really necessarily understand uh, the training. I mean, our training is written specifically, uh, you know, for, for Australian users, uses a little bit of slang, that sort of thing. So they might not understand that. So by allowing you to focus specifically on doing maybe uh, a classroom-based session or something like that, you can break down those barriers in a, um, a still a respectful way, a way that allows you to um, not make them feel like idiots, but also it's like a very intensive way of bringing people up. Uh, so, you know, that sort of training I think would be very worthwhile. Okay, fantastic. We'd like to thank you very much for attending today. Hopefully you have uh, got a lot of benefit out of today's session. Uh, certainly uh, Kevin and Damien are uh, real knowledge um, leaders in, this, in these spaces. So um, we will give everybody a copy of the recording via email that you'll be able to, to download. And I guess from a facilitator's perspective, I, I hope that we've answered those four key questions we set out to answer at the start of the session. Um, what are the security threats targeting my employees right now? And Kevin did a great job in, in answering that. Um, how do I put together an actionable security awareness strategy? And again, we've, we've covered uh, that off in some length. Uh, how do I engage staff and make them a part of the solution? And lastly, how do I provide measurement for that success? Uh, we'll be also posting this webinar uh, later on today on our website. Uh, no more questions have come through at this stage, so I'd like to again thank you very much for attending today. Uh, have a great day and uh, thank you again.